So what is going on guys, NandoPrince93 here with another video and I just released my you know full review of the Apple Magic Keyboard for the iPad Pro and overall I think it's awesome. If you're willing to shell out the money, then you're gonna be happy with it essentially, right? But I did wanna kinda of touch on the negatives of the actual Magic Keyboard and some of the things that are standing out to a lot of people. So this video is gonna be pretty much playing devil's advocate, right? So I'm gonna give you guys like five, six reasons why this probably isn't the keyboard for you and we're gonna just dive right in guys. So hopefully you enjoy and hopefully this helps somebody out when they're trying to make a decision on or whether or not to get the Magic Keyboard for their iPad Pro. So let's get into it. Okay, so reason number one guys, one of the biggest reasons why I liked the old Slim Folio keyboard, yes, the typing experience left a lot to be, left, left a lot to be wanted, right? Like, it was very subpar in terms of typing experience, no backlit keyboards, no function keys, very flat design, all those things, right? And I still found myself always going back to that keyboard case, and it was because of the functionality, right? The form, the form of it. it. It kept everything extremely thin, extremely light, and it was also a lot more versatile. It had more, more ways of interacting with it. Basically, what I'm saying is Apple compromised an area that, is kind, that kind of affected the way I use my iPad. So with the Apple Slim Folio keyboard, I was able to just flip the keyboard to the back and go straight into handwriting mode, right? But, but in this case, it's a little bit different. It's a little more of, of a burden, especially when you're in an environment where you're not at home, which for right now, obviously everybody's at home, so it's not that big of a deal. But if I use this at work a lot, I bring this with me to a lot of meetings. So before I would just be able to flip my keyboard around, put it on the table, start taking notes of whatever was going on versus now, if I had this whole situation going on, I'd have to pull off the actual iPad, put it down, either put away the keyboard into a bag or lay it on top of the keyboard, you know, when it's all closed up. So it's a little bit of a burden. So that's kind of one of my biggest reasons why somebody wouldn't get it. It's just the overall versatility of going from one mode to another, right? So keep that in mind when you guys are per trying to make this purchase and thinking about investing $350 on it, right? Because this, this keyboard itself is gonna stay at home most of the time and when things start to open up again, I probably will only take it with me when I know that I'm gonna be working on stuff by myself. If, I, if I'm gonna be using the iPad in front of people, I'm gonna avoid using my Magic Keyboard case for the iPad Pro, I think. I'm gonna try it out, obviously, to see how people react. Because again, it's a lot, right? And it's, it's not, like a laptop is known, it's common, people have always had laptops, but this looks a little bit different and it's gonna be almost distracting when you're in meetings and things like that. So that's, that's the number one thing that is kind of irking me a little bit is just the versatility of going from one mode to another. Another big thing that people continuously complain about is the fact that Apple refuses to put function keys on their actual keyboard. We didn't have it on the Slim Folio, we don't have it on this Magic Trackpad, so we don't have an escape key, we don't have you know music control keys, volume control, we don't have brightness control buttons, and people seem to be extremely upset about that, right? I, you know, I'm in the mindset that I'm okay with it because you can do all those things in other ways, but I do agree that you know having it on there or maybe building around that, because obviously in the current format, I don't think it may it would have made sense to add a function row key because of how how much they're trying to push the screen into your face, like push the iPad into your face, so it would be covered. But maybe Apple should have kept that in mind when creating the actual keyboard case to add those function keys to appease to appeal to everybody and not just people that are used to not having the function keys now with their iPad Pro. Another big thing is Apple has not done anything to help protect the Apple Pencil, guys. This is still kind of, you know, Apple didn't do it for their last keyboard, they didn't do it for this one. They can't just rely on the magnets to hold onto it because a lot of the times, I would say like 50% of the time that I put my, my iPad Pro with the pencil attached to it magnetically into a bag, I'll find it at the bottom of the bag when I try to pull out my iPad. So Apple like refuses to add some sort of protection. I don't know what it would look like. It would definitely probably ruin the aesthetic, but that's something also to keep in mind, right? I know that this keyboard does work with the Smart Buddy. I don't own one, so I can't really say if it actually works, but I heard that it does. But again, it's just gonna add extra bulk and extra weight, and then people are, again, gonna start getting annoyed about the weight of the iPad. And that's a perfect segue into the weight of the iPad itself, right? I actually, I don't have a scale, so I can't give you guys the exact numbers, but they're saying that when you combine both of these, this entire package with the Apple Pencil and everything, you're looking at about a three pound package, maybe a little bit less, which does put it into the territory of a normal laptop, into that MacBook Pro territory, 13 inch, into an everyday, you know, ThinkPad, whatever the case may be. So the added weight is obviously, if you guys saw my last video, it's there for a reason, right? But it does add weight, and if that is gonna be annoying to you, especially if you use your iPad as a secondary device, so you're always carrying a laptop and this device, it's gonna get heavy in your bag, guys. You know, you know what's, what's the difference between three pounds and six pounds holding two things together in a bag? It's pretty much up to you if that really annoys you, but 
you know, for students, maybe it won't be that big of a deal because they're already used to having textbooks and other things in their backpack. But for somebody who's trying to keep it as minimal as possible, as small as possible, as light as possible, and as mobile as possible, this could be a deterrent when it, when it comes to purchasing this. Because like I said, I would always go back to the Slim Folio keyboard because of how light it was and how portable it was. And that's why I loved it. I wasn't going back to there because of the typing experience. You know, I wasn't going back there because of the build quality. I was going back to there because of the convenience and how everything worked easily together. Another big thing that I've been seeing, you know, through the Twitter sphere and whatever the case may be, is when we saw the pictures and the renders and once Apple actually released what it was going to look like, everybody was attacking this tiny little trackpad, right? Like Windows devices, Microsoft devices have always gotten slack, especially their Surface products for having teeny tiny little mouse or trackpads, right? And I've actually used Surfaces before and yes, they are tiny and I don't like them. And again, to reiterate, this is also pretty small, but the learning curve is quick. And again, you're not gonna be using this a lot for point and click and moving around screens. It's gonna be used mostly for gestures, but if you are expecting like a classic Apple, like gigantic trackpad that you see on the MacBook Pros and the MacBook Airs, and even the trackpad uh, that they sell separately, it's about a third, maybe a quarter of the size as the trackpad they sell separately. So keep that in mind, especially if you have larger hands, larger fingers, that it's going to be a small trackpad and there's going to be a learning curve involved. Another thing that could be looked as a positive or a negative is the extra USB-C port that they added to the actual Magic Keyboard itself. You know, you know, it's great that Apple added a second USB-C port to kind of free up the main USB-C port, but it's still an issue. Because of the fact that it only does USB-C pass-through charging, and there's no data transfer, there's, you can't attach dongles, nothing like that. So you're still using this awkward kind of like dongle off, off center situation when you're trying to plug in external hard drives or external monitors and things like that. And when I use my USB-C hub, there's already power pass through through that. So there's no point in me having a second USB-C pass through. So it would have been ideal because it would have looked a lot nicer if you could just plug into this bottom port on the bottom left of the actual track or of the actual Magic Keyboard itself and put a USB-C hub there. So you have one cable for power and data transfer and secondary monitors and things like that to make it more of a clean look. So now you have two things sticking out of the iPad. You have a charger on the left and then whatever dongle on the right. So at the end of the day, it hasn't made my life any easier having that extra USB-C port. For some people it might, especially if you're only doing single dongle things. So if you just plug a hard drive directly as opposed to doing a dongle then a hard drive into that dongle. So maybe that use case is a little bit better. But for me, having that extra port just for charging has not done a single thing for me. And then there's two more things that I do want to touch on in terms of you know design compromises. And one of the main things like I spoke about, you know, why I like the, the last Apple Slim Folio like smart keyboard. Um, one of the main reasons was because it was waterproof. If you guys notice, I don't think Apple ever like came out and said, hey, it's waterproof, dump as much stuff on there as you want, it'll be fine. But the way it's created, it's, wove, it's like woven fabric, right? So whatever you spill in it, you can just dry up with a paper towel or with a towel. Versus this, if something gets into these keys, you might be out of luck, guys. So I highly recommend either making sure you're in a clear area so there's nothing that's getting into underneath those keys, or even I'm sure at so, like I'm sure somebody has some sort of keyboard cover already on Amazon or whatever the case may be. So get yourself some sort of keyboard cover. I'm gonna get myself one. I'm gonna look into some to see how well they fit onto here because I always had one on my MacBooks. Always had a keyboard cover and a screen protector on my MacBook. So. I want to protect my investment of $350 for as long as possible. So I'm going to get myself one of those plastic silicon or silicone, however you guys say it, keyboard covers just to make sure no dust and little particles don't get in. And I make sure the keycaps last as long as possible. And then obviously the biggest thing, you know, the monkey on everybody's back has to be the price of this thing. Like if you want a, just a typing experience, buy, you can buy yourself a Bluetooth keyboard for $15, $20, $25 on Amazon and prop your iPad on a stand and you'll be typing away and typing away with a decent experience, right? So in your mind, you have to justify like spending an extra $300, $320 for this thing, right? Which is, yes, it's an amazing keyboard, absolutely amazing keyboard. And the trackpad is really, really cool, but is it worth $350, right? That's a lot of money for an accessory to a product. So that's something you guys have to cost justify in your head. You know, how long are you gonna have it for? You know, how much typing do you really do? Is your iPad your main computer? Like if your iPad is your main computer, then I think this is a value, like this is a valid purchase if, you, if you're willing to ante up the money. If it's not, then again, that's up to you. You know, I don't know what, I don't know what your workflow looks like. I don't know how much you use a laptop versus an iPad. So $350 is an incredible pill to swallow when it comes to just an accessory for a product. And I'm just not happy about how high that price point is, guys. So 
those are my main reasons why you shouldn't get an iPad, why you shouldn't get the Magic Keyboard for the iPad Pro. I'm gonna release a video kind of rebuttaling this, giving you five, six reasons why you should get it. So after all this is done, you'll have three videos to help you decide whether or not you should make the, the $350 or $300 plunge into getting this Magic Keyboard for your iPad Pro. But I'm just gonna give you guys a little uh, spoiler. I love this thing, I think it's worth it. And my iPad is my main computer, so I can validate it and justify it. And I know it's gonna last me a long time. So that's gonna do it for this video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. Uh, you guys seem to really like the last video that I posted on my overall review and my thoughts and impressions on the Apple app, on the actual Apple Magic Keyboard for the iPad Pro. So thanks so much guys. Let's get the 10K subs here soon. Happy May, stay safe, stay indoors. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Until next time, 